Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Pandemic Gaga's Bible Study. I'm so glad to have you. And um, today we are going to finish uh, the, the Second Thessalon. Well, Second Thessalonians uh, will be in chapter three, and so that will be the end of this book. Um, so today we're looking kind of at um, where Paul is closing out his letter to his dear friends and um, at this church. And so we're gonna just see what all Paul has to say to them. You know, the ending of a letter um, is usually very special, I guess. You know, you wanna get a couple more points in there or you wanna reiterate a couple of the very points that you wanna make sure they don't forget. So let's see what, um, Paul has to say in this third chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Now, <clears throat> let's just look. Verse 1, Paul asked them to pray for him and his ministry. Now, that in itself is a great honor because these are babes in Christ. These are new Christians um, that are just learning um, about the church and about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has confidence in them. He has confidence in them, confidence in them to um, share his prayer concerns with them. And that is a great honor, y'all. That is a that's a statement of his confidence and his praise for the Thessalonians as they're maturing in the faith. And we don't want to uh, forget that. If if people don't come to us on occasion and ask us to pray for something. You know particular then we need to kind of check ourselves out that would be a, a, a good way to, to kind of judge how we're doing in maturing in the faith people notice fellow Christians notice they might not say anything but um, I guess maybe we could say that the spirit in them will lead them to the spirit in those who are more mature in the faith. And um, you have to take their confidence. You don't get to spread the word. And um, a lot of things go on there. But when somebody comes to one of us and says, will you pray for this? We need to do it. Um, if we don't feel we are capable of doing it, then we're just going to have to do one or two things. Tell them my prayer life isn't that good. Or tell them you will. And then do it. Then do it. Um, but we need to own up to where we are in our walk with God and um, our walk of faith. And if it's not quite there yet, that's one area that we need to work on a little more. And so um, leave, let's just leave that there. Now let's see what Paul wanted them to pray about. <laughs> My goodness. Here's what he says. The word of the Lord may run swiftly. And that the word of the Lord may be glorified. That's two, two things that he's asked them to pray. And then there is a phrase. Phrase. That when looked at has to blow them away because I know it did me and it would me if uh, if this was said about me and my prayer life it said just as it is with you so let's look over here in verse 2 and read it word for word here's uh, well we'll start in verse 1 and um, 2 finally brethren pray for us that the word of the Lord may be run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Just as it is with you, what a great job they are doing in maturing in the faith. What a great job they're doing, and I hope the same can be said for each one of us. But that was a high compliment coming from Paul, um, the great apostle. 
Now, there's a, a third thing that he asked about uh, for prayer. He said um, that Paul may be delivered from, e um, well, unreasonable and wicked men. You know, when you're in a ministry, when you're, well, as Paul, a missionary, um, going here, there, and the other, to share the gospel and the good news um, and to share in other people's lives and care for them. Satan will throw all kinds of things at you um, that may not be as big a deal if you're just at home, but he will throw people in there that are, first of all, just unreasonable. They just want to sit down, take your time when they know that you are on a mission and you've got things to get done for the Lord, you know what I'm saying? And you're on a mission. And Satan will throw somebody in there sometimes that just wants to sit down and talk to you about all this. And they're not there to learn about it. They're there to argue about it. And um, they will repeatedly come at you sometimes. Um, you, every time you see them on the street, you know, there goes another 30 minutes of, you know, him arguing, telling you how wrong you are, and trying to trip you up. And that can happen sometimes, and that is just a hindrance to somebody, um, anybody, who is sharing the gospel. So he pray, he asked them to pray about that, and then he also asked them to pray about these wicked men. Uh, there are some, especially when you're away from home, that they just don't, they don't want to discuss nothing. They just want to hurt you and shut you up and get you on down the road. And um, so if you're in a particular area for a while, it can get, you know, intense. And so Paul wants prayer for that. Paul's been through that. You know what I'm saying? He knows what he's talking about. Oh, yes, he does. So he, he trusts them with his needs that he has. And, um, and then as we look on down to verse 5, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Now let's pick that one apart just a little bit. I, I, just, I have some questions about it. But I'm going to read it one more time. May. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into lo the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Did you hear it? Do you, did you hear my wonder what I would be wondering about in there? Now may the Lord may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into patience of Christ. This, this verse does not say, may you direct your heart into, toward God, love of God. May you direct yourself into patience of Christ. You know, it's like walking up to somebody and saying, you know, please study the Word of God. Please, um learn how to be patient while learning the um, different um, foundational truths of God um, and when dealing with other people, please do that. You know, you're telling them to. I'm telling you to. You know what I'm saying? They're telling me to. And that's not the way it works. This verse says, now may the Lord direct you and me. The Lord direct you know who that Lord's referring to? The Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit, it's the Trinity. There, there's three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. And He comes and lives in the saints at the moment of conversion, at the moment of accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, and He directs us. He directs us into this. It's not a natural thing for a carnal person to just love God, to just love Jesus, to just love the Holy Spirit. We've been in sin way too long, I guess. You know what I'm saying? And the Holy Spirit has to prompt us, has to prompt us into these acts. So in this verse, the Lord is probably referring to the Holy Spirit. The Lord. 
Let's see what how many names we got here. Let's read it again. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the presence of Christ. One, two, three. One, two, three references in one sentence. In one verse. One, two, three. The Trinity. The Trinity. Wow. So I'm going to reread this right here. In this verse, the Lord is probably referring to the the phrase the Lord is probably referring to the Holy Ghost, to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we would be seeing proof again of the Trinity. Isn't that neat? It's just a little gem scattered throughout the Bible. If we'll take time to notice them. And um, this same Trinity is seen in chapter 2, verse 13. Let's just look back there for a second. 13, chapter 2, verse 13. We see... We see God, we see the Lord, and we see the Spirit. We see God, we see Jesus Christ, we see the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see the Holy Spirit. So how cool is that? Let's read uh, verse 13 in chapter 2. But we are bound to give thanks to God, always for you, beloved brethren, by the Lord. Let's say Jesus Christ, because their names can be interchangeable. Because God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You know, Trinity scattered throughout the Scripture. What a joy. What a joy. So, reading again back down here uh, one more time, verse 5 in chapter 3. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. We see the Lord, the Holy Spirit, always does the prompting. We see the Lord, as referred here, the Holy Spirit always does the prompting in the lives of God's children. It is up to us if we will be obedient. God makes a move through the Holy Spirit, then it's up to us to be obedient. Just as it is the Spirit that prompts a lost person to accept salvation. God draws the person. The person doesn't go find God. Doesn't go find Jesus Christ. God does the drawing. Just as in 1 John 4, 19, it says, 1 John 4, 19. Let's flip over there right quick. Go toward the end of your Bible. 1 John 4, boopity boop, 19. We love him because he first loved us. Proof positive that we don't, we're not the beginning. The beginning comes through one of the Trinity. The beginning for us comes through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, who loves us. He loved us first. So therefore, we love Him. Let's not ever um, get confused about who loved who first? Now, in verse 6, I mean, yeah, verse 6 in chapter 3, we see um, a set of commands coming. And so let's just look at this, commands. When I say the word commands, what do you think of? Um, commands. Commands happen in the, in the armed services, don't they? You have commanders, and then you have these under them, these under them, and these under them, and these under them. You got the chain of command. Scripture is pretty much that way. Scripture is pretty much that way. Um, in verse 6, let's just read verse 6, and let's see where all we want to go. Let's just see verse 6. But we command you, brethren, we, Paul, um, those that are with him, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that you withdraw, here's the command, that you withdraw from every brother, from every saint who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which we, which he received from us. The foundations, which, uh, God's foundations, not man's, God's foundations. When that, when a fellow saint is walking, uh, disorderly, uh, contrary to God's written word, God's foundation, we need to, um, withdraw from him we need to step back but now don't go don't go getting excited we got to finish what paul's thinking okay we got to go finish what paul's thinking so let's look at this first command a command from paul from the lord jesus christ withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not into and not in the tradition which he received from us and then we have uh, another command, 10 through 12, about the lazy and busybody saints. But the lazy and busybody saints. Let's see. Oh, I need to turn my page. The second command about the lazy and busybody saints. Busybody can be men or women. Don't go getting excited, guys. It could be you too. <laughs> ah. Now, first, let's remember these commands are delivered through the chain of command, like we talked about a while ago. And go over and read 1 Corinthians 14 40. Come on, I'll go with you. 1 Corinthians 14 40. Ready? Let all things be done decently and in order. That's why there's a chain of command. That's why there's a chain of command. If somebody comes into your uh, church, that's why pastors, who are, especially who are Bible pastors, I mean, they're preaching the word, they don't just give their pulpit over to anybody. They don't say come up like They're very um, protective of that as well they should be. And that's why um, they need to know that the person filling that pulpit, for whatever reason, is following the traditions of God and not the traditions of man. And they have that responsibility when they are shepherding um, a body of believers. And so that is why we have this command coming through. And see, the scriptures were written by God himself through the Holy Spirit through men chosen men and and then it is delivered to others through the pastors and all missionaries and all so we have to have a chain of command if somebody comes along and says well god told me you know basically this bible isn't finished yet and i got something to add to it now seriously you know that's wrong you know that, y'all. God wouldn't give us half a book. <laughs> no, that's not the chain of command. Sorry. So be vigilant and know the truth. Now, uh, and be sure and pay attention to that uh, 1 Corinthians 14.40. You might want to mark that because it helps in so many situations. It helps in more situations than you'll believe. It will really come in handy, and you don't want to lose that verse. So jot it down or mark it in your Bible. Now, the verse 13 through 15, he tells him, did, I, well, did we get into this number 13? 13 through 15, okay. He tells, oh, let's see. Let me go ahead. Oh, we were talking about busybodies, weren't we? So we're going to go back up here and start at uh, 10 and read through 12. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anybody will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in disorderly manner, not working at all, but just being busybodies. 
Now those are such we command and exhort, I mean really command, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. If you're too lazy to work, to feed yourself and your family, you've got issues. And you are to be no authority in the church whatsoever. In other words, you don't eat. And that's what the command is. The command, not the suggestion. The command. If you are able-bodied, you are commanded to work. And you are commanded to feed yourself and your family. And not expect even a crumb of bread from anybody. And that being down, it said, if you are hurt, say you get hurt, an automobile accident, and you're down for a while, then you should uh, appreciate the saints, your brothers and sisters in Christ, coming to help you out, whether it's a little bit financially, or with groceries, or whatever, for the time that you are down. But if you're skipping work just because you're lazy, and don't think people don't know, because everybody does. You're not supposed to eat. So don't don't even go there. It's basically, because it's a command. It's a command. And if you are a busybody, you need to be quiet and eat your own bread. <laughs> That's what it says. The command. If you you got time to sit around and run your mouth, I'm talking about all of us, then you've got too much time on your hand and you need to fill it with God's work. That's the command from Paul that came down from the Lord Jesus Christ. It says it right here in black and white. Now, let's move on down. Uh, let's go on and read 13 through 15. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this letter, this epistle... Note that person. Take note of that person. Pay attention to that person who uh, is not obeying our word, our command, because this command came from the Lord Jesus Christ. You take note of that person. And do not keep company with him. Because he's living in a disobedient life. And you don't need to be a part of a disobedient life. That he may be ashamed. Hopefully this will bring a shame on him. That would come probably from the Holy Spirit trying to draw him back in to truth. Yet do not, now here's a warning, do not count him as an enemy. He is a follower of Christ. He is your brother and sister. He's just in a state of disobedience right now. So don't count him as an enemy. But admonish him. Talk to him. Um, discuss it with him as a, you would a brother in love and in kindness and then it will be up to him uh, how he wants to react to that but we need to do it in love and kindness as we would a brother and walk them through the steps maybe um, to coming back to wholesomeness and um, truth and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I want to look at one last thing. As he is closing out his letter, we'll just see. Um, we're going to pick up on one little other um, tidbit of treasure that I noticed. Because, you know, he's been telling uh, all through the Thessalonians and through most of his other letters too, you know, a lot of commands in here. A lot of, you've got to do this and da-da-da-da-da. A lot of um, explanations and how to handle different things in the church and the foundations of the church and all, which is what he was doing back then, you know. And um, you may say, well, how all these letters are taken by hand. I mean, the U.S. Post Office was not there and neither was the Pony Express. <laughs> They're taken by hand. And, and church, other churches around would read these letters and then on and on, you know. And how were they supposed to know for sure that Paul wrote that letter? 
that it wasn't somebody, a deceiver, writing that letter and pretending like it's from Paul? How do they know? Well, let's read 16 through 18. See if you can catch it. 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in everything. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand which is a sign in every epistle or letter so I write the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen number 17 gives us the answer to the mystery of how they can know the salutation of Paul with my own hand which is a sign in every epistle so I write Remember, uh, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and most believe that um, it was probably his eyes. Because remember, on the road to Damascus, where he met Jesus, it was a very bright light. And um, I, that may have had uh, something to do with his eyesight, causing it. Uh, can you imagine the brightness of the Lord? And he had been blind for a few days. And so... Um, that very well may be it. So Paul would have um, had somebody else, maybe, you know, Timothy or Silas or whatever, he would dictate to them what he wanted to write, and they would write it word for word. But at the end, uh, Paul would sign his name. And what a unique signature that probably was because of his, his eyesight. Or maybe it was a handshake. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Some kind of palsy or something. We don't know for sure what it was. But um, it, whatever it was, caused his signature to um, look very unique. And praise the Lord for that. And so uh, we can be sure that Paul wrote, indeed, these epistles that are in the canon, that are in uh, the scripture and the Holy Word of God. How it all works together, how it all works together. Gosh, this is the end of um, our study on First and Second Thessalonians. Thank you so much for joining me through this. I've really enjoyed it and have been surprised how much information was packed into these little short <laughs> chapters. <laughs> we have so much to learn, and we have all the time in the world uh, until Jesus comes home to learn. And so let's do that. Um, it's looking like I'm going to do a one one or two day probably a one day study on pumpkins <laughs> now i'll let you figure that one out <laughs> but yes we're going to do one study next um on pumpkins and uh we're not making pumpkin pie and then i think we'll have to see but i, I think that we are going to do a study throughout the scripture on how we can know the will of God um, in how politically how we because we're in that season that we're in the season every four years and um, it, I, I'm not saying it's a political study on who I want you to vote for or who which candidate does what and all that stuff no just a um, we can get us maybe an outline, a, ch a checkoff list of what the scripture says about um, his will, God's will, in different areas that would be um, correlate with um, our country laws and things, um, our scriptural mandates and things, you know, the truth of the scripture and how we need to, if we need to, and if so, how we need to compare this um, situation with what the scriptures say about that same situation so that we know it's almost like a checklist so that we can know what God says about this what God says about this and then all we have to do uh, is let God tell us truth up against what it is and it may be the same truth and that's great you know um, but then we can take each candidate each uh, vice presidential candidate because you know they would be the next one in charge so that's what I would suggest is to check up against 
each candidate and then uh, up against each vice president and take a day and um, do that, do that. Let's not do willy-nilly and let's not do uh, like we used to always do, you know, because used to the parties were pretty close together um, and a lot of you may have switched from one party to the next or be an independent or whatever and all that's fine. Some of us had to be, be a particular party according to what area of uh, the country we live in in our area you know there may be few of this kind of party and more of that kind of party so if you wanted to vo vote in um, primary elections and stuff you had to be this party because nobody was running this other party so you had to list yourself as that even though you may you know in presidentials and stuff like that Senate and stuff you may choose to vote either side you know what I'm saying um, but used to that the sides the different political parties, um, and you know, we've had the Whigs and everything else, because they change, um, not often, but they have changed over the years, but they um, have become used to, <laughs> used to, I used to look at that, um, the, the uh, how do we used to look at it, the Republicans was all for the rich people, <laughs> and the Democrats were all for the blue collar workers, and you know, there was a time, and quite a quite a bit of time when that was that was true and that was really the only thing that that tipped the scale much is you know if you was a blue class class family a middle class or lower family or if you were uh, uh, making a better living and maybe the one in charge of the different uh, companies and stuff you know and it had a lot to do with tax write-offs and all that kind of stuff but on on um, the moral part or the um, defense part or stuff like that it was pretty close it was you didn't have to really think about all that uh, but today it seems and for several years now that the gulf is getting a little wider and wider and right now it's pretty wide and so I think we, it would behoove us um, to get the word of God out not play on emotions not play on tradition of what man used to do like our mommies and daddies <laughs> um, from their time when it was closer but to um, now that it's further away for us to take um, another look at the scripture and of the you know major situations you can't get them all but of the major differences and um, that seem to be a lot of talk about and see what the scripture says and then turn a blind eye to our emotions and vote as though God Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit was pulling the levers that you have studied about and doing his will and not our emotional or our family tradition will. And I think that would be really wise because he's not big, our Lord is not big on man-made traditions. And um, he is very big on what the truth of the scriptures say, especially some in some of these topics. And so um, it's a hard thing to do because we're so used to doing it and being able to do it the other way. But um, I want us to just take a, a few studies and see what we can come up with. And just to kind of help us along, get us a checklist and um, almost like a blind test. Okay, this one did that, this one did that. You know, some of them have been in the political arena for years. Some of them are newer. Um, but we can look at not necessarily what they say, but what we have, what they have done how they have voted in the past can tell us what they have literally said, their quotes, and you can find all that on Google. <laughs> hey Siri, you know. And um, and then see what God says. Because we want God's way. As believers in Jesus Christ, we want to be in line with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we as Christians must uh, do our due diligence in knowing the truth. So that's going to come up here. But first, first, it's a study on pumpkins. You don't want to miss it. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Love you. <laughs>